Darwin's tree of life is most likely not a description of how life on Earth emerged and diversified. I know that's a shocker and yet some scientists go as far as to say that the tree of life has actually been annihilated by an onslaught of negative evidence. Join me for this video to find out why one of the most popular arguments for Darwinian evolution may actually be a non-starter. Hi, my name is Lucas and welcome to our series on intelligent design and critical thinking about evolution. A short recap on the ground we've covered so far. In the previous three videos, we showed how paleontology poses an insurmountable challenge to the theory of evolution. Darwin himself predicted that countless intermediate animal forms must exist within the fossil record, given that organisms gradually evolved from one species into the next. However, what the fossil record actually shows is the exact opposite, namely that whenever new species appear, they do so suddenly and without evidence of precursory forms in the geological record. The most prominent example is the so-called Cambrian explosion which happened around 530 million years ago, when about 20 animal phyla suddenly showed up on the stage of life out of the clear blue as it were, but with no intermediate forms from the pre-Cambrian strata. I've also talked about the total of four Darwinian attempts to solve the dilemma of the Cambrian explosion and have explained why all of them fail. Check out this playlist up here to get to those videos. Given that no attempt to reconcile paleontology with evolutionary theory has succeeded, Darwinian evolution have come to admit that the fossil record doesn't fit with their theory, as we will see at the end of this video. For the same reason, they've started to turn their focus towards another field of study in their search for support of evolution, homology and phylogenetic trees. The importance of these two for evolutionary theory cannot be emphasized enough. Also, while lay people who argue for evolution in everyday discussions may not know the term homology, they constantly refer to this concept in making their case and I'll show you how in a minute. Minute. The technical definition of homology is essentially sequences or structures that have a similar relation or position within an organism corresponding in structure and in origin, but not necessarily in function. This probably seems a bit unclear for now, and it reflects the fact that biologists often have difficulty determining whether two structures or genetic sequences are homologous. But let me first sketch a few clear-cut basics for you to help explain the idea of homology. It all starts with chapter 13 in Darwin's On the the origin of species, which bears the title The Mutual Affinities of Organic Beings. In that chapter, Darwin essentially claimed that similar anatomical structures in different animals offer significant support for his theory. For example, when you look at the forelimbs of these six creatures, you'll find that while they may look different, they still share the same fundamental structure. This is a case of homology and, according to Darwin, supports the hypothesis that all life forms have evolved from one common ancestor. On a side note, intelligent design is compatible with common ancestry and there are multiple views on this topic within the intelligent design movement. If you've ever watched a YouTube video on evolution or discussed evolution with a friend, chances are those forelimbs got mentioned. Darwin's original argument from homology was concerned with anatomical structures as one could see them with the naked eye. However, the rise of biochemistry in the 20th century has opened up the possibility of investigating homology not only on the anatomical, but also on the genetic or molecular level. The idea is basically this. Just as similar anatomical structures in different animals point to common ancestry and descent with modification, the same can be said of similar molecular structures in different animals. You've probably heard people say that evolution must be true because we share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. It isn't actually true that our DNA is 99% similar to that of chimps, but suffice to say that this is essentially a popular and simplified version of the argument from homology. It's important to know that Darwinian scientists don't just point to the similarity between forelimbs, legs or this and that gene and then say, ha, evolution in a random case-by-case -case kind of fashion. While this may capture how homology is understood and utilized in discussions by the average person, evolutionary biologists have a more complex understanding of homology. According to them, studying homology is nothing less than the key to mapping out the entire tree of life. Evolutionary biologists who study what is called systematics and phylogeny are engrossed in efforts to reconstruct the tree of life. We'll be talking about this a lot from now on, but before we do, there is something that's absolutely crucial to be aware of for our discussion. Something which can easily go forgotten, and it's this. Evolution is not just an abstract idea or a concept. 
No, if evolution is true, if there was one or a few ancestor animals from which all other animals have evolved, then this means that there was one specific way in which this actually happened historically. This is perfectly captured by Richard Dawkins who says that There is after all one true tree of life, the unique pattern of evolutionary branchings that actually happened. What Dawkins means, and rightly so, is that evolution is not just a theoretical concept and that it doesn't really matter how it played out in history. History. No, evolution must have unfolded in one specific way and accordingly, the tree of life has one specific shape with each branch and node of that tree occupied by a specific organism. That's why the aim of evolutionary biology is to take the idea of evolution and show how it actually played out in real life or to reconstruct the course evolution actually took in history and to show where specific organisms sit on the nodes and branches of the tree of life. In principle, the Darwinian argument from homology, coupled with the aspiration to draw up the tree of life, does make sense and here is why. If it is true that all organisms are ultimately related to each other due to their descent from a common ancestor, then the more genetic and anatomical cross-examinations you run between them, the clearer a picture you get of how all these organisms are related to each other. Each comparison should help you crystallize the tree of life, so to speak. Also, and this is absolutely key, if all organisms are related to one another, then all your comparative studies of homology no matter whether they are rooted in anatomy or genetics, should end up cohering with one another, because they would all uncover parts of one and the same big picture. Again, as Dawkins said, there is after all one true tree of life. Of course, this is not to say that mapping out the tree of life is supposed to be easy, that all comparisons should immediately fit hand in glove with each other and that it should never be the case that evolutionary biologists will have to make adjustments as they aspire to reconstruct the tree of life. However, it is to say the following, if evolution is true and if all animals go back to one common ancestor, there should emerge from systematics at least an overall tendency towards a unified picture of how evolutionary history played out. Hopefully by now you understand what homology is and what end it serves in reconstructing the tree of life. Because it's now time to give this whole endeavor a critical look. Ever since gene sequences began to be used to construct the tree of life, evolutionary biologists have run a wide range of studies in both genetic and anatomical homologies, comparing various genes, proteins, RNA molecules and anatomical features between different animals. However, the results of these studies have not converged. In other words, we don't get one big coherent picture, but several pictures which mutually contradict each other. For example, biologist Michael Sivanen compared no less than 2000 genes in six animals from various phyla. Clearly, given the breadth and depth of his project, one would have expected that this one study would have also yielded one account of evolutionary history, one tree of life. However, here is what the new scientist reported. In theory, he, Sivanen, should have been able to use the gene sequences to construct an evolutionary tree, showing the relationships between the six animals. He failed. The problem was that different genes told contradictory evolutionary stories. Not only did Sivanen himself have no problem admitting his failure, but he also moved on to challenge the Darwinian paradigm itself by saying that we've just annihilated the tree of life. It's not a tree anymore, it's a different topology entirely. What would Darwin have made of that? Now, Sivanen's study is not the exception. The new scientist pointed out that many biologists now argue that the tree concept is obsolete and needs to be discarded. The evolution of animals and plants isn't exactly tree-like. Accordingly, the magazine went on to describe the Darwinian project of mapping out the tree of life as lying in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. Trends in ecology and evolution has pointed out that evolutionary trees from different genes often have conflicting branching patterns and the Biological Reviews has acknowledged that phylogenetic conflict is common and frequently the norm rather than the exception. Anthony Rokas, who is considered a leading figure in genetic homology, concluded that despite the amount of data and breadth of taxa analyzed, relationships among most phyla remain unresolved. He went on to state that the complete and accurate tree of life remains an elusive goal. So far, we've only looked at the picture of the tree of life that emerges from studies that are gene-based. 
However, the argument from homology concerns not just genetic but also morphological similarities in different animals, as we said in the beginning. And if it's true that all organisms are related, then the conclusions drawn from genetic homology should be congruent with those drawn from morphological similarities, right? Or to use an analogy, you can put the jigsaw puzzle together based on the shape of the pieces or their colors, and it doesn't matter whether you take this or that route or even switch between them. In the end, the pieces will fit because they are part of one and the same big picture. However, that's exactly what you don't get when it comes to molecular and morphological homologies. Instead, as was noted in science, animal relationships derived from these new molecular data sometimes are very different from those implied by older classical evaluations of morphology. Similarly, Nature observed that evolutionary trees constructed by studying biological molecules often don't resemble those drawn up from morphology. So we've looked at comparisons of trees based upon different genes and comparisons between trees based upon genes versus morphology. The one option that is missing is the comparison between trees based upon morphological features only. Note that in contrast to genetic homology, the investigation of morphological homology is as old as the theory of evolution itself, as it was one of Darwin's key arguments for his theory. So clearly, Given that this endeavor is over 160 years old, one should expect that here at least coherence and clarity about the one tree of life would be within reach. Yet even in this case, the records are no better than everything we've seen so far. That's why two zoologists from St. Andrews and Oxford University state that, taken together, modern re evaluations of traditional evidence support different and mutually exclusive subsets of relations. So, systematics, no matter whether they are concerned with genetics, morphology or both, consistently yield mutually contradictory trees of life, which is why it's been said that in point of fact there exists no such thing as the traditional textbook phylogeny. A diversity of different schemes can be found. I said at the beginning that Darwinists have resorted to studies of genetic or molecular homology partly because they realized that the fossil record did not confirm evolutionary theory. For example, evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne says that now we have a powerful new and independent way to establish ancestry. We can look directly at the genes themselves by sequencing the DNA of various species and measuring how similar these sequences are, we can reconstruct their evolutionary relationships. Essentially, what he means by independent is independent of the fossil record, which has challenged evolutionary theory due to its lack of transitional forms. Richard Dawkins takes an even more outspoken stance as he bluntly states that we don't need fossils, the case for evolution is watertight without them. Now these statements have a rather strange aftertaste as they basically communicate that molecular evidence is more important than evidence from the fossil record. In other words, they imply that the work of molecular biologists is more valid than the work of paleontologists. Yet, oddly enough, evolutionary biologists are actually forced to depend on the science of paleontology when trying to determine determining the timing of evolutionary history. In light of this, Dawkins's dismissive statement about fossils is quite awkward and raises the question of whether with his overconfident rhetoric he's trying to cover up for the evidential weaknesses plaguing evolutionary theory. But what's even more awkward is this. The very aim of neo-Darwinists in studying genetic homology was to establish evidential support for evolution and to draw up the tree of life independently and without the need of the fossil record. Yet this project has manifestly failed and it has failed even though supposedly without those fossils the case for evolution is watertight. However, instead of homology and phylogenetic studies yielding one coherent picture of how evolutionary relationships played out in actual history, there have emerged all sorts of mutually contradictory and exclusive scenarios, so much so in fact that scientists speak of the annihilation of the tree of life. Now, given that resorting to genetic homology and constructing the tree of animal relationships was supposed to make up for the fact that the fossil record challenges evolutionary theory, and given that the Tree of Life project failed, we're now back to face the hard facts of paleontology. Or to put it differently, if the hard facts of paleontology oppose the notion of there being a Tree of Life, and if that supposed Tree of Life cannot be independently established by genetic homologies, well, what evidence for Darwin's Tree of Life are we left with? 
To put it bluntly, Dawkins' claim that there is, after all, one true tree of life simply isn't supported by the evidence. To this day, studies in homology based on certain genes or RNA molecules and anatomical traits continue. And to this day, these studies fail to offer us one coherent picture of evolutionary history, even as meta-studies are conducted whose goal it is to integrate several studies into one big picture. In other words, after 160 years of studying anatomical homology, homologies and around 60 years of studying genetic homologies, Darwinists have still failed to tell us what the tree of life actually looks like. What this means is that those who study homology simply assume evolution to be true, but they've never actually demonstrated that the ancestral evolutionary relationships between different organisms are real. Check out my channel Deflate if you want to hear more from me, or go to intelligentdesign.org to learn more about the issues we talked about in this video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.